So Carbon 5, uh, that's where I work. I work in San Francisco. We also have an office here in Santa Monica and a couple of other offices around the US. Um, we are a strategic digital product consultancy. There's lots of words. Um, we work with our clients really collaboratively uh, to build software applications, basically. We have teams of product managers, designers, and developers. Um, who partner with our clients really closely to sort of develop their product ideas. Um, the important thing, I guess the most relevant thing for you all tonight is that as a consultant PM, um, it's different from being at a product company where you own this product in a really robust and ongoing way. Um, but the thing that I do when I give away these products each time I do a project, but I also have to build a team every time I do a project. Um, so often I'm leading projects um, and I'm on the hook for making that team work. So hands up here if you lead a team currently. Okay, so some of you lead a team. What about influencing teams? I don't believe you <laughs> for a second. <laughs> Okay, so some leaders, lots of influences, including Alexa. <laughs> um, and if you're a product manager, um, or even if you're a product-minded designer, we have a couple of those in this room, um, it's your responsibility in part to make sure that your team can build a great product. Um, and that can be really difficult when you're not also the person who is in charge of that team. Um, and in our, uh, in our practice, in our product practice, we actually don't include very much conscious design of team dynamics. Uh, and this is a thing that I, I started to feel was kind of lacking. Like what if you all were able to take what you know about product and apply it to the team that's making your product? What would that look like? So usually when we think about, <laughs> you know these people, when you think about teams and team development, we're thinking about one of two things. We're thinking about individuals and their development, and we're thinking about outcomes. So individual development is really important. I don't know anyone who would argue that professional development doesn't matter. Uh, so I'm not saying we should do away with that. But I do think that it is insufficient to think about teams in a kind of raise all boats way. Like we'll make these people better, therefore their teams will be better. That's what we need to do. Um, so I think there's more to be done there. And then the outcomes part, we teams have goals. That is really important. It's vital that teams have clear goals. We roll those goals up to organizational goals, roll it down to individuals, that's all great. But an outcomes only focus doesn't, again, doesn't really tell us that much about how the team is doing as a team. It tells us about how the team is producing something, the outcomes of the product that it's making. Maybe we have some stats about the team's work, um, but it doesn't tell us a lot about the team as an entity. So I, Okay, don't know why that happened. Um, you can look at that for a second. Um, or you can look at this in Or you can not look at anything. Slides are really unimportant. Um, <laughs> so, um, you need to start, I, I believe we need to start thinking about how we develop teams as teams. Oh, huh, no worries. Um, not, just our, not just as groups of individuals, not just as people who produce outputs, um, but as, as a thing in and of itself. So the good news for product people is that you already have tools that enable you to do this. Tools from your top product tool set um, that you can apply to teams. I'm going to just take a little moment and see if I can make this easier. Okay, that worked. All right. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about a couple of specific tools that, um, that you probably already have. Um, one is Eric Reese's Lean Startup, the Build, Measure, Learn cycle. Uh, and the other is product um, slash team road mapping. Does everyone, has everyone here uh, used Build, Measure, Learn or read Eric Reese's book? Lots of nodding. No, that is okay. <laughs> I just want to get a sense. Um, and uh, what about roadmaps? Does everyone use roadmaps? 
for their products a little bit. Okay, no, that is also okay. <laughs> so, build, uh, build, measure, learn is um, Eric Reese's lean startup, which I, I totally recommend reading. Uh, he takes the scientific method and tries to. He's yes. actually in town like tomorrow morning in the next one in the city of LA. Is he really? He's a, yeah, cross campus. Yeah. All right, here, right? Doing, yeah, it's over like 16th in Colorado, or what in Colorado? I don't know what, I don't know if it's here. I guess we was on Yeah, it's on his new book. Yeah, oh, awesome. Yes, he's on a little bit of a, a book tour right now. He's got a new book coming out. It either came It's out. It, it just it came arrived this week? in San Francisco in your yeah. office. Oh, nice. Awesome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Rad. I can't wait to read it. Um, and Lean Startup Week happens in San Francisco, which is his big conference. So that's happening next week. So he's all over the place talking. Um, and uh, yeah, so he wrote this book, The Lean Startup, where he attempted to take um, the scientific method and apply it to how we build products in a startup um, uh, environment. So he, uh, in a really brief <coughs> way to talk about his, his cycle. He talks about how you build, you have a hypothesis that you can test, um, and you do this kind of evidence-based, experiment-based uh, product development cycle. Um, so I started thinking about how we might use that cycle. In fact, how we probably are without really thinking about it. Um, we kind of apply that cycle to how we build teams. Um, <clears throat> the clicker works again. <laughs> <laughs> so we are, are not going to start with build though um, and the reason we're not going to start with build is that unlike a startup who is making their first ever product you very rarely get to start your team from scratch although if you are a startup making your very first product that is the exception um, <coughs> when you are working with a team for the first time that team probably uh, exists in some form for, for most people um, and you need to sort of learn some stuff about them. So this is my main departure from that Lean Startup model. So I'm going to just pause and sit with this kind of science analogy that he uses for one more second. Um, because at this point where we don't have a team, we're, we're not building a team from scratch, um, we probably don't want to go in with a hypothesis because we're going to miss a bunch of stuff. We don't know anything about this team, let's say, or we know a lot about it because we're already in it, but we're not really sure what we know. So when I think about the first step with a team, I'm not thinking I have a hypothesis, now let me like, move forward with that and figure out what I'm going to do to test it. I'm thinking more like, it's more like a, a zoological approach. It's more observational. So if you're going to put it in those kind of science terms. So you're doing observational research really about your team and your measure at this point is really uh, open-ended um, and it's really exploratory. It's much more from, I guess, from a UX, it's more from a UX skill set in that, in that respect. Um, so your UX team, also they're your friends. Um, and if this is not stuff that you have done, it might be something to, uh, to tap your UX team for. Um, so we measure because we want to know where to focus. Um, we can't focus on everything at once and in a minute when we look at this, the product dartboard tool, it has 12 dimensions. That is a lot of stuff to work on if you're a team. It's really overwhelming. <clears throat> so you want to find a way to focus. There are lots of tools that you can use for, uh, for measuring at this early stage. So. At, some of you may have read Google's Project Aristotle, um, Great Teams Project. They did a lot of research. They have the benefit of having thousands and thousands of teams that have worked together over a long period of time. Um, they did a really fantastic piece of research that identified a lot of things that were important for great teams. Um, but the number one thing that they discovered was that psychological safety is incredibly important for successful teams. So, and there are evidence-based surveys that you can use uh, to measure psychological safety. So, tools like that exist, yeah. your HR software. Just to interrupt, what does yes. that mean? Psychological safety. Uh, it's, I think the, a working definition is like people feel um, safe enough in the team that they're able to kind of ask questions or challenge um, or, you know, enter into debate and things like that. They don't feel like they're going to get shut down or um, in some way like punished, heaven forbid, um, within that, that uh, kind of professional environment. 
fascinating. Yeah, but it's definitely worth um, digging out the okay. the Project Aristotle um, work. There are a few good articles about it. Um, yeah, HR software, if you're at a place that's big enough to have a suite of HR tools, they often have surveys and things like that that can be really useful for learning about how your team is feeling and how they're going. Um, really all the way at the other end, does anyone use team temperature as a practice? No, so cool to be able to introduce team temperature. Um, it's the simplest tool in the world. Um, when you're either having a meeting, reflection, um, a lot of teams will do it on a regular cadence, uh, you can ask the team a really simple question like, how is everyone feeling today out of five? And people will hold up their fingers, like I'm feeling a three or a five. Um, or you can just do thumbs up, thumbs down, um, so, sort of a Roman vote, vote on how's everyone doing? Oh. And you know, I mean, you know right away, like even doesn't matter, you're not measuring this in a scientific way. It doesn't matter if they end up here or here. If they're doing this, it's different from this, right? Um, so team temperature is really great and simple. Um, and product artboard is the piece of paper that I handed you. We also have an application. Um, this is a team assessment tool that we built at Carbon5. Um, and the reason that, uh, that we wanted to build this is because we specifically wanted to look at product teams. So in researching this tool, I found that lots of people have written about how to make great products. Um, there's tons of amazing research going back decades about effective teams and how to make your teams better. There was not very much, so a couple of things, but not a lot of stuff that actually got at the overlap between the the great product and the skills and habits you need to make a great product and the effectiveness of the team building that product. So uh, I wanted to make something that actually captured both of those things in a single assessment tool. So when we measure a team, we talked at the start of the, the sort of measure section about the fact that we wanted to find a focus, an area of focus by, um, by measuring. Um, did anybody, looking at your dartboards in front of you, does uh, an area of focus jump out that you think, yeah, we should probably, we should probably think about this? Yeah. Does anyone want to share what the area might be? Well, you might, you all might guess this one, coming from a university, uh, measuring success. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That one's like a, yeah, that's a nice idea. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's super important product dimension, right, like if the team is all able to, when when I was thinking about these product dimensions, it's not just about uh, like the metric or the product, it's about the team's relationship with that, so the team's understanding of what they're measuring and why, and therefore their ability to, to make sure that they're actually driving towards that goal um, is really important. Anyone else want to share an area of focus? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so I'm on a product that is delivering very, very quickly. Um, by most sort of product metrics, we're doing very well. Um, but I feel awful. Uh, I am really sort of burned out and tired. And going through this, the clearest area of focus uh, was clear responsibilities. Mm. So I'm realizing that um, even though we really understand what our product has to do and by when, uh, knowing who's responsible for it and who ultimately sort of takes ownership and how fast they need to have it done by is a real sort of blind spot for them. That's really interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, I would just echo that. Um, yeah, I think um, that and also like shared process because I think once you have like a good established process, with like defined roles and responsibilities, it can really help clear out like if a problem is to occur, you can kind of find the root cause within the process what, what you need to kind of clean up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think most of uh, the projects that I've worked on has been, um, a lot of the confusion has been about roles and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. and then you get to this whole finger pointing mm -hmm. scenario and then it's like, all right, we gotta turn the other way because once that happens, it, it creates kind of a friction between the, between the kind of all the team members. So that's kind of what I'm currently seeing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, and that can be really hard. And I think that what you two both said about um, the clear responsibilities and the, the shared process, it kind of touches on how some of these areas we might not think of as being about psychological safety. Um, but both of those things really affect psychological safety. If people don't really understand their roles, it can lead to these kinds of behaviors um, that make people feel like they're, they're not safe to, you know, to debate or challenge things or ask questions. Um, if they don't quite know what their roles are, they don't know whose toes they're stepping on, or somebody maybe is gonna point the finger at them. You know, that's, that's not a psychologically safe team. And you mentioned the shared process as well. Like it's the same kind of thing. Like we don't know what's expected of us. We don't really know how to resolve this. We don't have ways to resolve this. It kind of it doesn't um, give people a, the safety of like a structure around them. So all of these things kind of play into that that larger topic of psychological safety. But this doesn't measure directly, only indirectly. Um, so I'm going to. So I'm going to show you a real team now. I have a little case study that we can walk through together. So this team, like those two teams we just heard about, I didn't plan on this, I swear. Um, <laughs> the lowest score here, this is, so this is an aggregated uh, score. This is a screenshot from our app. Um, all of you have um, obviously just done one response from the team. This is six people on a team, um, and this is their aggregated dartboard. Uh, so clear responsibilities scored the lowest for them um, in this case. And then they have a, a, a few things hanging out in that in that kind of twos sphere, not a bunch of threes. Um, so for this team though, and these are all the dimensions, we don't have to talk a lot about these. Uh, we know that was their lowest. The other thing that teams brought up a lot when we were researching this tool was that they didn't just care about the thing that had the lowest score, they were really, really interested in the variance. So they wanted to know which things had um, like a, a large kind of deviation in their answers. For this team, you couldn't see it on that screenshot, um, but we have another chart that shows it. Their biggest variation was in clear shared vision. So. Obviously you have more variation, it's going to score a little higher probably. Everyone agreed that clear responsibilities was a problem for this team. Um, and for this team they were exhibiting the kinds of behaviours you described. So there was, uh, there was kind of blame. They also weren't sure about like who, um, who owned a thing and therefore they sometimes felt like other people were undermining them and taking uh, like kind of taking responsibility or taking credit for their work because it wasn't really clear who was supposed to be doing what. So this is not a pleasant environment to be in for sure but they all agreed that that was a problem. Clear shared vision, some people gave it some fours and fives, some people gave it some ones and twos and for this team they were like well we all know this is a thing but what is going on with this? Um, because it seemed to them more troubling that they disagreed about something um, as important as this. And also, that seems kind of weird, right? Like, if the vision is clear and shared, then <laughs> wouldn't we all say that it was? <laughs> So this team actually decided not to focus on their lowest scoring dimension. They decided to focus in on clear shared vision. And this is where we go from measure into learn. Um, and you, you're all product people, so you know why. This is the same as when we get metrics on our products. Metrics tell us what, but they don't tell us why. And it's the same with your team. So they, they know that they all agree that they don't have clear responsibilities. They also know this weird thing, right? Some people think we have a very clear vision, some people don't. They have no idea from doing this. This is just a dumb assessment tool. It can't, it's not smart, it can't tell you anything. Um, so they have no idea why. And this is, um, hey, no worries. Ooh. Uh, all right, these are not soft skills. This is a thing that I like to start arguments about, frankly, all the time. Um, do, does anybody else hear people describing this kind of like team building or leadership as soft skills? 
Yes. Yes, lots of nodding. Does it annoy anyone else? Yes. yes. We've okay. had a big debate about it. Oh my god, thank god. <laughs> Sometimes I feel so alone. Um, these, so this is my, the small beginnings of my fight to get rid of that word, but these are not soft skills, um, I don't think. Sure, some of these are, you may use interpersonal skills um, and other warm, fuzzy ways of talking to people, communication and things like that. Um, we may or may not want to label those with a potentially pejorative word like soft skills. Um, but <clears throat> when you're thinking about um, moving from where you've done a measurement about your team and you're learning about how to change it, um, you are really using a robust and rigorous process. And there's nothing soft about this at all. Um, and it's not particularly warm and fuzzy. Um, in fact, what we're doing here is treating your team like a product. You might not want to use those words with your team. You might, that might be fine. Um, but uh, as, I mean, I'm in consulting, so our team literally is our product. That is what we are selling. I don't necessarily say that to them. Sorry, Nikki. <laughs> Um, I'm used to being sold. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is this is really where the work comes in. The measuring part is kind of easy, um, but the real work comes in when you start to dig into that and figure out, okay, why? Why is what is happening with this? I can almost guarantee that this room is familiar with all of the things um, you already <coughs> described. One of them. Um, so uh, I'm going to skip over five minutes. <coughs> to it. Um, we use a lot of different activities for learning. This is just a handful. Um, you could pull almost anything that you would use for learning about your product. Um, maybe that's not true. But many of the things that you would use when you see your metrics and go, huh, what the hell is going on there? You can apply those to your, to your team as well. Um, and things you're already doing with your team may also be helping with this. So if you're doing regular, regular retros, hopefully you are because they're rad. Um, that's a really good way of understanding like, well, what is actually going on? How might I match up the things that people are talking about in retro that they want to change um, with these, these areas that we've identified as problems? A um, couple of things, again, from UX. Uh, I think that, that some of these UX skills are kind of underutilized when we think about, um, when we think about teams. Team interviews, especially in a team that, where there's not a lot of psychological safety or there's low trust, um, it can be really good to just do some kind of empathy interviews, almost like a customer interview with your team to understand what's going on for people, um, how they're feeling, uh, and you know, just really get a picture of what's going on for the team as a whole. Um, observational research, that might sound super weird. Um, the case study <laughs> example, though, uh, I, I will give an example of how we actually did this very informally um, but you might just be watching like how your team is working together and it doesn't have to be a formal study you don't have to time people and things like that you might want to um, but uh, it could be just just uh, observing when do people go to lunch what do they do when they come back are they talking to people where are they sitting just noticing how your team is behaving physically in space is really useful um, mentoring I think is a really interesting one because we usually think of it as one way right like I'm mentoring you I am giving things to you it's kind of broadcast but that isn't actually true mentoring is um, is two-way and you're hearing things from the person you're mentoring you there they have questions they have concerns they have areas they want to develop you can learn a ton of stuff from mentoring people um, and five whys We'll come back to you because I'm going to use that with my example team. Does everybody know what five whys is? Have you used it? Some people are shaking their heads. Okay, so five whys is a technique that comes from lean manufacturing, and the um, and the uh, the purpose of it is to do root cause analysis. So the idea, I think it's um, I think yeah. it's huh, yeah, it's from Toyota, right? Um, and it's in the the Six Sigma process. Um, really, it's you behave like a three-year-old and you ask why a bunch of times. That's what you do. <laughs> and it sounds like you use that in... I work for Toyota, that's why. Oh, uh, you work for Toyota! Yeah. So you have done I this... I worked for Toyota. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yes, I'm very familiar with the high-wise. Right. Yeah. So it gets beaten into you like, 
day one. Right. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And now kind of intimidating because now I'm like, I probably don't do it properly. No, no, <laughs> you're fine. Don't do it right. Mm -hmm. um, but really, like when um, when I use uh, when I use five wires with um, with clients, uh, it's it's just really about like digging into the things the the. And you ask why, the, the idea is that you ask why uh, five times, but which sounds really simple, but you have to figure out at each step, like, what's the next why I'm going to ask, like, what am I going to focus in on? Um, and really, you're looking for a kind of a, a revelatory moment, a thing where you're like, oh, that is really the thing, that's the root cause of our problem. Um, <coughs> sorry, I have to unlock the slides here. So we're gonna. I'm just gonna run through this five whys. You don't have to read all of the things, but this is more or less the five whys that this team went through. The first thing we have to do with five whys is not actually ask why. The first thing is to understand what our problem statement is. So for this team, the problem wasn't oh we scored low on this dimension, um, or we you know didn't like what we saw on this assessment, or we think we don't have a clear shared vision. None of those things was actually the thing they wanted to know about. The thing they had a problem with was that they didn't agree on whether they had a clear shared vision or not. That was their problem. So why? Why don't they agree about this? This is crazy team. So it turned out when they asked that question of the group. This is where they, they had a reasonable amount of trust on their team. Um, it turned out that the PMs, so their product managers, had communicated the vision and they documented it and they'd done a pretty good job and they felt pretty happy with it. And they felt like people were re reflecting it back to them accurately. They're like, we don't see a problem. Developers were seeing an issue not with the work that the PMs had done, um, so there was no disagreement there, uh, but they saw in their day-to-day -day work that there seemed to be kind of different interpretations of that vision coming out as they, as they went about their work, um, and when they saw features, you know, coming down the pipeline and being released, they're like, "Huh, well, <coughs> so somehow isn't matching up. We don't seem to share this vision, even though the PMs did good work." So why, why was there this disconnect? For these guys, um, their developers were working in silos. And that meant that the vision was being made a reality in lots of different ways by people who were not really communicating day to day. And I want to pause at this point and say that what this team did <coughs> and the, the results that they found and the things that they did to fix it are by no means the right answer for every team. So there are plenty of things that happened with this team that they identified as a problem that would be completely fine on a different team in a different context, as you will see. Why are they so siloed? Because people were working on one part of the code base and not on anything else. Now this is, I don't know if anyone comes from a dev background, this can be completely fine and even necessary, especially, you know, you have giant, we work with enterprise clients with giant code bases, there's no way that everyone is startup style working in every piece of the application. Um, so this is not wrong. But they identified it as a reason that they had these silos and they had these these experts were being created. So they said, well, why do we work that way? Why are we putting people in these silos? And this is awesome because they were thinking about, okay, it's not necessarily wrong that we work that way, but why do we work that way? Well, it turned out they had inherited a whole team. Um, it was a, a remote team, actually. Um, and they knew one part of the code because they had built that part of the application and the, they reshuffled the teams, they joined this team and they knew that part of the product. So they didn't change that. They were like, well, you guys know that part. You keep on building over there. But why did they continue, right? Like, why did they not ever question that and just went, okay, well, this is our silo. We're going to work like that. They just, it just never occurred to them. It never occurred to them to work in a different way. And these are the kinds of things where teams often, you know, you fall into habits, you have a way of working, especially at enterprise, but not only at enterprise level. And when you don't deliberately make these decisions, you can fall into a place where perhaps it's not ideal that we're working in these silos. Is this actually what we need to do to build our product? 
So as they're going through this process, they're thinking the, the learn stage includes some ideation, right? Like, what are we, what can we do about that? Um, what do we need to do to change the way we're working? We agree that this is the problem. We think this is the root cause. Um, how might we change it? So this team actually uh, decided that the way they were going to change that was to pay more. Um, now, in our five Did wise, you just say pay more? Pay, oh, pay, pair. Pay more money. <laughs> it's like pay more money? Oh, yeah, that'd yeah. be great. They decided that their engineers needed more money. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> to work you, with somebody. Maybe, right? More. <laughs> but that's never going to happen. Um, no, uh, pairing in, uh, in engineering teams um, can be really, really valuable. So this team was not pairing at all. And they said, well, we are in silos, we don't like it, we want to break them down. So we think that the mechanism for that is going to be to pair. Then we're in build, right? Now we've talked already about the fact that we don't get to hire and fire on this team. So <clears throat> what actions can we take that, uh, that can build this team by building its effectiveness and building its capabilities, not by building its um, headcount? For this team, uh, we built a team roadmap. So I think maybe half of you said that uh, a product roadmap was a thing that you had done in the past. Um, I started making these team roadmaps mostly because I didn't quite know what to do. I knew that I wanted this team to get to a place. I knew that that could happen immediately. And for me, being a product person, I was like, okay, that feels like a roadmap. Let me make it look like a roadmap. So I made a roadmap. Uh, so I'm going to stick with my, my example team and their lack of clear shared vision and their need to do some pairing. So what we actually wanted for this team um, wasn't for them to pair 100% of the time. Um, it was for them to become an autonomous team. That's awesome. Um, how do we get to autonomy? Has anyone ever worked with a team of engineers and said, be autonomous, just go be autonomous? Has anyone ever tried that? not that great. <laughs> this team had actually kind of tried that. There was in their organization, there was a lot of focus on the idea of autonomy. Like you should be able to be these little autonomous units owning your part of the product. And we had a bunch of cowboys being like, I will make the decisions. I don't need to talk to anybody. They were super well-meaning and pretty good engineers, but some weird stuff was getting built. <laughs> So they still wanted to be autonomous, even though they just identified that as being their problem. Yes, they wanted to get to a point where they were truly an autonomous team, not necessarily autonomous individuals, and certainly not random people going off and building right. weird things in the way that they thought, which was kind of how they were interpreting autonomy. But they wanted to be a truly autonomous team, i.e. they could build their product and, and work on their product and release um, on a regular cadence and not have to kind of uh, be um, waiting on other teams and um, you know figuring out a whole bunch of dependencies and moving in lockstep with a giant roadmap that never moved forward and basically you know ending up with a product that wasn't getting released on a regular cycle. So they wanted that kind of autonomy as a team. So we wanted them to get there, right? Um, but if the team is not aligned, then autonomy is really dangerous because then randomness happens. <laughs> so what they wanted to do first actually was not jump to autonomous. Let me move. Um, and it wasn't even jump to align, like try and hammer it in more. The PMs have done this great job of sharing their vision um, and yet we're still not aligned. What they actually wanted to do was be collaborative. And weirdly, once we started road mapping, clear shared vision kind of happens here in the middle, right? So we've now discovered a whole big milestone, a big chunk of work that has to happen that clear shared vision is sort of dependent on. So milestones, we broke that out into some milestones. Like how are we going to know when we're getting towards uh, these, like we're getting towards these types of things. Um, and they came up with milestones. Again, these are not milestones that you should copy down and use in your team. Um, they're very specific to the team. Um, but they, uh, one that was really interesting to me was this one, this idea that 
people weren't doing releases. They had one team that did releases. No one else knew how to do a release. Like you could say, go release the product and they wouldn't know how. So they identified that as a thing. Like when everyone on the team has done a release, we'll know we're getting somewhere. But first, they were like, we want our developers to be working in all parts of the code base. We're gonna pair them up so that we, they're learning the different parts of the code base and they, that's what they're gonna do. Which leads us to the last part, which is the tactical actions. So how do we get there? Yes. Was this still a group of six people that you started out with the initial? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so they did the, that initial assessment um, there. And uh, they, um, yeah, they kind of worked through all of this with their management and us as well. We weren't included in the six at that point. Sorry, um, the yeah. previous slide, why yeah. is it not um, first aligned and then collaborative? Because it seems like people are going to collaborate, but then they don't have an aligned or shared vision. Right. Yeah, that's a really good point. And again, like it depends on the team um, exactly how you would order these things. So for this team, they had identified that they um, they kind of knew the vision, they thought they knew the vision, but the work that was coming out didn't actually reflect the vision. So when they were delivering stories, they didn't, they were just a little off and they didn't quite, you know, one feature would be this way because it's one interpretation of what they thought the PM had said and another story would be more like this. And then they end up with rework, right? Because then the PM's like, oh no, I, it's not what I meant. Um, because they've gone off in their silos to actually do the work, mm -hmm. so that they think they know what they're doing and then what that comes out is not quite right. So <clears throat> they felt like the reason they weren't aligned was actually not that they needed to talk more about getting aligned. They thought that actually the thing that would change that was the collaboration. And that if engineers were working together and talking and then collaborating more closely day to day with the product people, that that is how they would get to alignment. Oh, okay. So that's why for, for this team. Okay. <laughs> but yes, I, this is not like an order of operations yeah, yeah. that is necessarily right for, um, for any other context. Yeah. So, tactical actions. Um, the tactical actions, so the, the big tactical thing that they want to do is pairing. Um, and uh, they, they wanted to figure out how to achieve that. So one reason that this team perhaps didn't pair was that they didn't really know how. Pairing is a skill um, and it has to be learned uh, and not every developer wants to pair and not every developer is good at pairing. Um, but this team had, you know, they came up with these actions themselves so they were not opposed to pairing and, and yet they weren't doing it. So that led management to sort of think, well, why? Why aren't they? More whys, so many whys. Why are they pairing um, if it seems like it would be helpful and they don't hate it? And this is where the kind of observational research came in. Um, I don't even remember who it was, but somebody on that team looked around, somebody in a management position, important, they have money, the, somebody who could spend money looked around and said, this really isn't set up, this space is not set up for pairing. How come they had tiny desks, like little rows of desks, sort of like this big, and they had a little, not very good monitor, um, little crappy monitors on, on each desk on an arm, and they sat near each other. So everyone's all in the one space. It's hard to like have con conversations when you're right next to somebody else. Um, and there just wasn't space. There really wasn't space to pair, to be at like a shared monitor and, um, and be comfortable pairing. And um, I don't know if you've seen developers pairing a lot, but you know they really need that big monitor. They they type. The two of them will both type. They'll have a keyboard each often, and they'll have a single monitor, or maybe a monitor and a laptop, um, and they're working together on the same piece of code. They're talking about it. They're problem solving together, um, and it's a super effective way of working through difficult problems. It's also an incredibly effective way to share knowledge. So for this team, it was more about the knowledge sharing aspect that they, they wanted to do it. So this genius manager um, looked at this issue and said, you know what, we need pairing stations. We need to make a pairing station. So they had money to order a big monitor. They ordered a couple of big monitors, some extra wireless keyboards, some mice, laptop stand, put your laptop on. 
and created two pairing stations kind of at the end of a row so you're a little bit away from other people on a slightly larger desk uh, and that gave them that gave their team the space and the um, conditions that they needed to be able to do pairing. I like to tell this story because it always makes me kind of stop and think like would I ever have thought that when I saw that my team needed help with clear shared vision, I should buy them new monitors and keyboards. <laughs> that is not how I would have gone about solving that problem. Um, if I hadn't gone through these steps with this team and seen it happen, I never would have thought that, that, would, um, that would help. And it's important to note that this little tiny tactical action is also not the thing that's gonna be the game changer. Like, this is not magically going to lead to the vision being clear and shared, but it's a step along the way, right? It's a baby step. It's also a measurable step. So this is a circle. And at the beginning, we talked about the fact that you kick off doing this sort of more observational um, measurement that is not tied to a hypothesis. Now we've actually, I didn't pause to talk about them. We've kind of got two hypotheses running here though. We have a hypothesis that pairing is going to bring us closer together and bring us into alignment around our vision. That's a hypothesis. We don't know if that's true. It is measurable though. Um, and the other one is that people will pair more if we provide them with these pairing stations. And we think that ultimately these things are going to shift the, the needle. So once we're at this point, we no longer, we, we might want to repeat the product dartboard or some survey, uh, maybe on a quarterly basis, that's completely valid and we should do that and see how we're doing overall. But now we're in experiment land where we need to be measuring the results of the experiments that we're running. So for this team, um, they can measure whether people are pairing more. That's actually super easy in their, their backlog tool. They can see how many tickets or how many stories have two developers' names on instead of one. Um, and they can look at one iteration to the next and see if that number increases. Um, and they probably, you know, maybe they want to say it increases by 10% or 50%. Their hypothesis might include uh, the number that they expect it to grow by. Um, so that's, that's that hypothesis, pretty easy to test. And uh, for, the, um, for the other one about like, we think that pairing is going to lead to more of this knowledge sharing. This is slightly trickier, you might have to think a little harder about that, but for, um, for this team, for a lot of teams, you can actually look at metrics around whether things got accepted. So we were talking about that churn, that the thing coming out the other end wasn't quite right, so stuff would get rejected or there would have to be rework from the product manager. As long as you're actually using a tool that tracks it got rejected, I had to do rework, you can actually measure that, like did I see fewer rejections, did I see more acceptance the first time round of this work that was happening. Um, when, they, when they were paired. When they were paired. Exactly. When, yeah. when they were paired, yeah, yeah, exactly. And even um, you might look just overall, you know, in this iteration, did we see more acceptance, um, more like, quicker than the other one, um, than the previous iteration or iterations. Uh, and you would expect to see that changing over time. Yeah, so some of those tools that we often tell teams not to, to use, we often tell teams not to be metrics vision uh, driven, don't you know count how many points you did in an iteration and show the team's progress that way. Um, but you can actually dig into those tools to answer really specific questions and they're incredibly valuable. So thank goodness that they give us all those charts. Um, that is all of the stuff I have to talk at you about tonight. <laughs> um, but uh, hopefully um, the dartboard proved helpful to you yeah. and I'm um, absolutely happy to take questions or if you want to chat more about the stuff that you found right there. Thank you. Um, well, uh, for me, I'm looking to start a, uh, an app. So mm -hmm. I'm not a product manager, but I'm trying to learn the ins and outs of developing a team and all the parts that I need. Yeah. Um, it seems, I don't know if uh, your company provides services for people in my position. Uh, we, we, do yes. have, we do have capital ready to go. It's just a matter of building teams. So. Yeah, well, are you, 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 you <laughs> <laughs> um, Yes, 
we do. Okay, because you, you mentioned you, you work with larger enterprise oh. clients, and we're, we're not that by any means. Yeah, so. no, we work with um, about, this is not a sales pitch, but we work with about 50% startup clients, okay. <coughs> um, and then the rest is uh, a mix of enterprise growth companies, um, some non-profits. So I think it's about 25 to 30% growth companies, and okay. same for enterprise. So yeah, we, we absolutely work with startups. Um, and so you are the lucky person in the position of being able to like build a team from scratch and build yeah. a culture from scratch. Yeah. So for us, we're kind of we're kind of making a decision between trying an agency to get the minimal minimal viable pro viable right. product, hiring a CTO to manage that process. So mm -hmm. whenever um, it launches and we want to bring it in in house, we know how it was built and what was designed. So right. We're thinking about that solution or. Um, we would love to build a team internally, but we understand that takes time as well too. So that's Absolutely. kind of where we're. Um, yeah. Can that's you share what kind of app it is? Uh, yeah, it's, we started uh, thinking um, that it was gonna be in dating, but then it kind of when we really looked at the solutions that it solved and the features, it would be more of, uh, adult men's entertainment. So mm -hmm. adult men. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. I think we we often find with um startup teams that we're working with uh, because we do like to be collaborative and we don't tend to build a product and hand it over so we're, we're building a team at the same time as we're building a product um, so a lot of what we do is focused on how do we get this team to a place where we can hand this over to them and they can keep carrying it forward uh, because otherwise you can build a thing but if you build it kind of like this team if you build it in your silo then the company that paid you to build it actually doesn't have what they need uh, in terms of their skills and in terms of the team they've built um, to take it forward. So you help source teams too? Is that what we you do? We do help with hiring, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We help with, um, we, we help with interviewing and uh, and then we will pair. Um, that's uh, the main thing we do. We pair both uh, cross-functionally and we'll pair developers and we'll pair product people to um, skill up that, that new client team. Do um, do startups usually work in like a like a single office, or they work remotely? Or um, with our startup teams, often um, they'll come actually work co-located with us in our office. Um, right. So and that's that's um I think especially with new teams, it's super valuable if you can actually be in the room together. It builds a lot of trust and that psychological safety aspect that that I talked about earlier. So if it's at all possible, it's awesome if that can happen. And a lot of our clients, startup clients in particular, will come work in our office. Where's your office? We have an office here in Santa Monica, as it happens. Joe jo and Nikki. We can, we can <laughs> take this offline. Yeah, we can oh, talk about okay, this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm from Orange, yeah. Cal I'm from Orange County, so. Uh, oh, OK. Yeah. OK, well, th thanks, everyone, for uh, listening. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. OK, great. Does anyone have any other questions? Yeah, yeah. I work at a nonprofit. Awesome. So have we used it at nonprofits? Yeah. Uh, have we used it at nonprofits? I'm trying to think. I feel like we must have used it with one of our <laughs> nonprofit clients. Um, no, yeah, we have. Scientific we method, have I would say. used it at, um, at a couple of nonprofits. I personally haven't worked on a nonprofit project for a little while, but other people have used it at a nonprofit. I I was at a nonprofit. I was at the Asian Museum. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh no, yeah. I, you were here when I said that. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, Yes, not so good on scientific method. Not awesome on measuring things very often. <laughs> Let me see, um, where's like that one said. There? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think it can help any team, or not even necessarily this tool, although you are welcome to use it, um, but any of these types of tools can, can really um, help any kind of team. Yeah. yeah. Yes. So I know that we just went through maybe a portion of some of the, you know, for your case study uh, mm -hmm. team um, that you kind of identified to, to kind of review here with us. But mm -hmm. um, when they, I mean, I guess, can you tell us a little bit about like long term, like what, oh what yes. were they planning to do? Like once they've tackled that one with clear shared vision, what was up next in the queue in terms of you know, making sure their team is optimizing on all the other maybe weak points that they have within the team because then that, you know, problems can shift into a different direction if maybe some aren't addressed. And then also there's there's so many dimensions here. Yeah. Um, for a team, you know, for, I guess I want to get your thoughts on like, 
stepping back a bit mm -hmm. um, and looking at values with within the organization or within the startup or whatever nonprofit you're looking at, mm -hmm. do they try to maybe align them with those values to also kind of make sure that they're keeping that in mind too? Mm -hmm. um, so th I think the answer to the, the second part first, um, I think always has to be yes, like whatever, whatever it is that you're doing, whatever tools you're using to measure and figure out what to do differently with your team. Um, your team always has to grow in a way that is aligned with the organizational values, um, although not always in a way that's aligned with the existing organizational culture, because maybe you're part of trying to change that. Um, and those two things often don't match. Um, so uh, yes, I think that they would want to um, align with the, with the values. Um, and hopefully those values are not too out of step with these kinds of things. I think this, you know, some cultures and even values can be very oppositional, for example. Yeah. Um, the research that we use when we put this together tells us that that is not a great way to make a successful team. Mm -hmm. So if you were actually trying to build an oppositional culture, you would, because you felt like that was gonna do, I mean, they do tend to, those kinds of teams tend to go like this. Um, the, so they tend to have a lot of success early on, um, those kind of very um, very oppositional, very uh, competitive, um, sort of a very achievement-driven cultures um, can have a lot of success really fast, uh, but then it tends to taper off. It's not very sustainable. So there is good reason to go for that if you want that early, fast growth. Um, this is going to tell you that you're weak in some areas if that's what you're trying to do. Um, that was a long answer to your question. Uh, but I wanted to go back to the other part. Just because, I, I guess because like, mm -hmm. you know, just coming from where I used to work, yeah. I, I just you know that I've been presented like so many different types of tools like mm -hmm. this. Like there's like uh, thousands of them out there that you can look at and they're all fantastic. But I guess my question is what, mm -hmm. um, because it sounds like you've worked kind of a full gamut of like startup, more, you know, stabled organizations to nonprofit, which is completely different. Have you found that the tool has provided, you know, a good general kind of foundation to align with all those different cultures? Because they're going to be completely different. Yeah, so far we have um, on the teams that we work with at Carbon5, um, so that's some caveats. Um, but uh, we, I think that we tend to work with teams that also align with our values. Got it. That's that. So that may be biases these results for sure. Um, I can't remember the the number off the top of my head. We've used it with around thirty teams so far, I think, um, and that's spread across um, across all the types of organisations that we work with. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, I th I believe and. This is, this is biased, of course, because I'm a human, um, but I believe that the evidence that it's based on should apply across teams and organizations, um, regardless of their culture, like that, that you are going to get better results ultimately if you, um, you know, if you build psychological safety in your team. And, um, and there, there are some other big bias assumptions, though, especially on that product side. Um, and, and this is where I get pushed back from enterprise a little bit. I think you should build an MVP. So I think having the smallest hole and getting it out there, like I drank that Kool-Aid. Um, some people don't agree with that, um, especially in enterprise. Uh, I feel like there's sufficient evidence that I wanted to include it in here, that that is actually a better way of releasing products. But, you know, that's an opinion. That's it's an opinion with some evidence to back it up. I bet you could find evidence the other way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Oh, what if you, be, you mentioned psychological safety? Then, mm -hmm. um, what and where does this fit? There were like five tools, I think, or five. Uh, there were some H. There was like HR tools. Mm -hmm. There was the psychological safety surveys. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember. Maybe two other things. Team temperature. Um, team one temperature. One yeah. How do you use those in conjunction with this? You know, um, you could use. Really, it depends on what you have at your fingertips, the size of your team and your organization, um, and I guess what you're comfortable with and what your focus is. So, 
we use this a lot of the time because we're always working with product teams and because this gets at both the product and the team effectiveness part, um, that's really important to us. So we want to make sure that we're actually including that. If you do a psychological safety survey, it's not going to, it, it, its job is not to understand the product side. Um, so that tool's not going to measure that, but it will do a really good job and a, you know, a really evidence-based job um, of measuring psychological safety. So if, if that's a big concern um, on your team, then that might be the kind of thing. You can Google them. Um, I Definitely there are uh, psychological safety surveys online. I forget if you have to pay for them. Yeah, that's fine. But um, yeah, Do you but feel like that's a prerequisite for getting into this discussion? Like, if you didn't have psychological safety, could you bring out the dartboard? Or you're just sort of, you got to fix the, si the safety element first. I think, uh, I don't think it's a prerequisite. We've certainly had some teams, some very conflict-ridden teams, um, where I think that there was probably pretty low psychological safety. And they actually used this, we had a project lead who used this really deliberately um, because the team had very low trust. And there was a lot of blaming going on. And he um, was, when he was running regular retros, which I think were happening weekly, wow. um, he was finding that he could not get that. It was just, there was lots of conflict. He couldn't get the team to be honest about things. He couldn't get them to talk about the stuff that they would talk about one-on-one. -on -one, so they couldn't come together as a team mm. and problem solve. And it was pretty harrowing. Um, and so he actually grabbed this. We didn't have an app then. He was using a paper version. Mm -hmm. And he started to use this in place of a regular retro and the thing that worked for that team was that this gave them very unemotional categories to respond to. So they weren't, they didn't have to come up with their own things, which were like laden with emotion and blame. And this person said this and I didn't like it. They were like, oh, well, I feel like we're doing this on this, this abstract thing, like just abstracted at one level that helped that team. So. I don't think there are there are hard and fast rules about that. Um, I can imagine. Uh, I actually had a team recently at Carbon Five, not a team I worked on, um, that refused to use it because of that exact reason. They were like, "No, this team is so low trust, and if we do anything that might rock the boat or expose, huh. they were really afraid of exposing things that would make the team feel upset." So they jumped the other way and they said, "We don't want to go there." This asks questions that are sensitive. We don't want to talk about them. So they went what way? Like, they just didn't do anything. Uh, they, they. You're they coaching them. <laughs> they chipped away. They chipped away at the at the challenges that they had for sure. Um, but they, um, uh, they mostly did it one on one with people. So they they worked one on one with the client team members. It's more just like the culture, like they're like to save face. So they're not. They weren't that type of culture that allowed for problems to be abstract enough where people could talk about them. Exactly. There was there was a, an area of disagreement, especially on the team, where some people on the team fundamentally didn't believe in the product. Mm. Ooh. Yeah, right. <laughs> and that was what they didn't want to surface. They were like, this is supposed to surface product issues and we don't want to do that. Mm. So for them, they were like, we are going to focus on different areas to ignore this whole thing. So they're fine. They're fine now. <laughs> <laughs>